Hi everyone, thank you for attending my talk. Uh, today I'm going to talk about community rings. So I know that uh, most of you are familiar with the notion of a ring. A ring is a non-empty set that you can add two elements and also multiply two elements, right? And all the good properties that we hope for, right? Addition should be commutative and associative, right? Multiplication should be associative and should distribute over addition, but multiplication may not be commutative. So if you multiply two elements, A and B, A B may not be commutative, right? For example, uh, what rings do we know? Ring of integers, right? This is a commutative ring. Then we have rational numbers, real numbers, complex numbers, right? These are the rings that you're familiar with. A non commutative ring, for example, is the ring of n by n matrices with entries chosen from Z, right? So if you randomly choose two matrices, most probably they're not commutative. A B is not equal to B A. Rings can be finite. For example, if let's say P is a prime number, Z P, which means Z mod P, is the finite ring. For example, right now, uh, if we can, if every non-zero element in a ring has an inverse, is inverted, right, is a unit, then we call that ring a division ring. Okay, and if a division ring is commutative, we call it a field, right? For example, this guy is a field, right? This one is, this one is, but this one is not. You can't do division. <laughs> This one, if P is a prime number, is a field, right? This one is not. Now, do we have a division ring that is not a field? Have you ever seen such a thing? What's that? General linear group. Uh, maybe a little bit easier. Numbers. Talk about numbers. There is a set may not know that is larger than complex numbers. These are somehow four dimensional complex numbers. These are called Hamiltonian numbers or quaternion. These are very useful, for example, in rotation geometry. They use it in, you know, making games, video games, right? These are very useful stuff. What is the definition of, uh, what is a quaternion? So, as a vector space over real number, it's a four-dimensional vector space. The basis elements, let's take one, i, j, and k, right? Four uh, independent vectors. Just like complex numbers, for example, if I truncate it up to i, then this is just a complex number, right? Now you have two more elements. And we have this property, i squared equal g squared or k squared equal negative one, right? Addition is component-wise, it can add two elements, right? And, and component-wise add them. Multiplication is a little bit trickier. This gives you the multiplication table. One is the unity. I times J is K. K times I is J. J times K is I. Now go the other way around. I times K is negative J. J times I is negative K. K times J is negative. So clockwise, these can be multiplied. Counterclockwise, we get negative, right? And together with this relation, this gives you uh, Hamiltonian numbers or quaternions, and this is this turns out to be a division ring. So you can divide, but it's not commutative, right? For example, I J, which is K, is not equal to J I, which is negative, right? So this is an example of a division ring that is not a field. All right, uh, how about a finite division ring 
that that is not the fear. It's an infant, right? You agree that this guy's infant because the coefficients are coming from the number. So, do you know any example of the division ring that is not the field and it's finite? Well, of course, this guy is a finite field, right? How about the division? Uh, every finite division ring is a field. Is a field, exactly. So, there's a beautiful theorem of Wetterer that says every finite division ring has to be the field, has to be community. All right, so this was an introduction about uh, familiar examples of rings. Now, there is a very interesting problem. If I give you an abstract ring, R, right? And if I tell you, okay, what are those identities? And if I assume those identities, the elements of the ring satisfy those identities, right? It could be just one identity or a set of identities. Then the ring has to be commuted. Right. For example, one trivial identity is AD minus B A equals. Right. <clears throat> what about anything else? Do you know any other identity? For example, if I have a ring in which every element is identical, which means if I raise any element to the power two, I get A back. Right. A squared equals A. This ring is known to be community. So this is an identity that forces the ring to be community. What is the example of such a ring? This comes up in logic. These rings are called Boolean rings. For example, one famous example is that if you take any set and you take its power sets, which is the set of its subsets, right? Take two subsets A and B, define addition to be the symmetric difference of A and B, right? You guys know what this is. <clears throat> A minus B union B minus B. This is the symmetric difference. And if you take a product to be intersection, then this becomes a ring, right? Which satisfies that property. Anything squared is itself, right? It's quite obvious from the definition of product. And this turns out to be community. So we're going to see a proof of this in a moment, why this identity guarantees that the ring is community. Uh, <clears throat> a natural question is, what if I replace it with 3? And assume that every element, Q, is equal to A. Is the ring commuted? Well, the answer turns out to be yes. But the proof is much harder. What if I turn into four? What happens? So this is what we're going to talk about. All right, let's start from the Boolean ring case. So we assume that any element squared is equal to itself. We want to show that R is good. This is an easy exercise. Maybe you've seen it before. Right? Let's look at negative A. A is arbitrary, right? Negative A by, uh, by the hypothesis is negative A squared. Negative A squared is A squared, right? A squared is A, right? By the hypothesis. So anything, the opposite of any element is equal to itself. Now let's look at A plus B. By the hypothesis, A plus B is A plus B squared. Let's expand it. A squared plus A B plus B A plus B squared. Note that I can't write 2 A B here because I don't know if the ring is commuted or not. So I put it in this way. A squared is A, B squared is B. So I get this. Now you have A's cancel out, B's cancel out. So this guy has to be zero, right? So A, B should be negative B, A, and by step one, negative B is just B, A. So A, B equals B, A, which means the ring is commuted, right? Now, you want to try to prove that. What happens for power three? I want to prove that still the ring is commuted. But before that, I need a very simple lemma. The lemma says, if you have a ring, 
If A B equals zero implies that A B okay. equals zero into our range, then every idempotent element belongs to the center of the ring. Center of the ring is the set of all those elements that commute with everything, right? And center turns out to be a sovereign. Note that if A B equals zero, we can conclude that B A is also zero. Look at matrices, right? Can easily make an example that this does not hold in general rings. If this holds, every idempotent element becomes to the center. So how do we prove it? Let's take an element R. <laughs> Assume that R is an idempotent. I want to show that this commutes with everything. So let's take an arbitrary element A. Let's look at this product. R times A minus R A. This is equal to R minus R squared A, right? In fact, there are A from right, multiplied by R, you get R minus R squared. A, R is idempotent, so R equals R squared, so you can see it. The hypothesis tells me if two things are multiplied, you get zero. You can flip it, right? Flip it and multiply, multiply out, you get A R equals R A R. Right now, let's play this game with this guy. A R minus A times R. Again, factor out A from left. You get A okay. times R minus one. Prime. So you get this, and that is zero. Use the hypothesis one more time. Flip it. You get this. Multiply out. You get R A equals R A R. Right. So AR equals RA A R equals RA by steps two and three. So R is in the center. Commutes with everything, right? So an identical commutes with everything. This is something that we're going to use in our exam. I'm going to show that if A cubed equals A for every element, then R is commuted. Let's see how we can do it. First, we show that if AB is zero, then BA is also zero in any such ring. Well, it's fairly easy to see. BA, by the hypothesis, is BA cubed. Anything is equal to its cube, right? Now, what is BA cubed? I need to write BA, BA, BA three times, right? But in the middle, I can specify AB two times, right? Which is zero. <coughs> so this is zero. By the lemma, every idempotent is in the center. I'm going to make take advantage of this. Next step, I look at a squared, then square it. I get a to the fourth. I write it as a cubed times a. A cubed is a, right? By the hypothesis, so you get a times a, a squared. This means square of any element is idempotent. Right? By step one, square of any element is in the center. Note that these elements are arbitrary. Step three, let's look at a squared plus a and then square it. I get a to the fourth plus 2a cubed plus a squared. You can write a to the fourth as a cubed times a and the rest of them. Replace a cubed by a, so you get a squared plus 2a plus a squared. And this is two times a squared plus a, right? Now, a squared plus a is equal to a squared plus a cubed by the hypothesis. Write it as a squared plus a quantity squared times a squared plus b. And from step three, I calculated a squared plus a squared as two times a squared plus a, right? Multiply out to get two times a squared plus a squared. This is square of something, right? By step two, square of anything is in the center. So this guy is in the center, center of the sovereign. So a squared plus a is in the center. Right? Are we done? Not yet. A squared is in the center. A squared plus a is in the center also. So Center is the sovereign. Subtract them, you get A in the center. 
So I took an arbitrary element A and showed that it is in the center, which means it commutes with everything, right? So the ring is commuted. All right, now look at power four. Again, we try to play similar game. These are just ad hoc methods. Negative A is negative A equals to four. By the hypothesis, that is A to the four, and that is A. So two times anything is zero. Now, if A B is zero, very similar, B A is zero, because you can write B A as B A to the power four. By the hypothesis, expand it, then you can specify three A Bs in the middle, which are zero. So that is it. By the lemma, every idempotent is in the center. So we have this property again here. Let's expand A squared plus A, square it, you get this. Two times anything is zero by step one. <laughs> You're left with uh, A squared, and A to the fourth is also A, so you get A squared plus A. Now this means a squared plus a is identical, right? So it should be in the center. Now, anything squared plus itself is in the center. Replace a with a plus b. a plus b squared plus a plus b is in the center. So in particular, it commutes with a. So a times this guy is this guy times a, right? Now expand both sides, you get this, simplify, you get this. <clears throat> Again, b squared plus b is of this form, step three, right? So it is in the center, so it commutes with everything, including a. So this is equal to that, right? So you cancel out from both sides, so you get a squared b equals b a squared which means a squared in the center, right? Because b was arbitrary. A commutes with everything. A squared commutes with everything. Again, step three, we showed that a squared plus a is in the center. Step four, we showed that a squared is in the center. Center is a subring. Subtract that, you get a is in the center. So the ring is. How far can I go? Power five, power six, power seven. So it gets. Uh, it's increasingly harder and harder, right? So I need a systematic method if I want to show that. Here's my goal, to show that if A to some power can be very high, equals A, then R is committed. So I need a systematic method. And here's the theorem. <coughs> it's Jacobson's commutivity theorem. It's a very beautiful theorem. It's not a type of theorem that you may find in any book. It's kind of forgotten, but it's a very beautiful theorem in ring theory. It says, if for any elements A in the ring, there is an integer greater than or equal to two, such that A to the power of that integer equals A, then R is to And note that N of A depends on A. So for any A, that power can change, right? You don't have to have a fixed power. Right? Now, we're going to prove this theorem. So, in ring theory, the most important ideal in any ring, I think, is Jacobson rabbit. So, whenever we want to prove something about rings, the first thing we look at is it's Jacobson radical. What is a Jacobson radical? You might have seen this before. If you have a ring R, J of R, called the Jacobson radical of R, is defined to be the intersection of all maximal left ideals of the ring. <clears throat> so you might say, what's so special about left? What about maximal right ideal? Well, if you intersect maximal right ideal, it turns out to be equal to the same ideal, right? But it's not obvious. <laughs> right? So. Let's look at the Jacobson radical. We first show that the Jacobson radical is zeros, right? 
kind of show you. Let's take an element inside the Jacobs array. Oh, by the way, uh, this is obvious that this is a left ideal because it's it's a section of maximal left ideal, right? But it, what is not obvious is that this guy is actually a two sided ideal, right? It absorbs elements from the ring from both sides. Let's take an element inside it. Since it is a two sided ideal, I can raise this element to some power, let's say n of a minus one, it's still a little ideal. Now, one of the very interesting properties of Jacobs radical is that if you take any element inside it, one minus that element is a unit, right? So this element a to the n of a minus one is in the Jacobs radical. So one minus a to the n of a minus one is a unit, which means there exists an element R that if you multiply from both sides, you get one, right? <coughs> but now, what can I do from this uh, step? Let's multiply from right by A. A times one gives you A. A times this guy gives you A to the N of A. And a times one gives you a. A is uh, equal to n of a is equal to a to the n of a by the hypothesis, right? <coughs> so this is zero, right? So this is equal to zero. On the right hand side, you have a. So a is equal to zero. So I took an element inside Jacobson radical and showed that it's zero. So Jacobson radical is this is a very uh, common method in mathematics. It's been if you want to prove something, you reduce the problem into something easier, right? And then you prove that easier statement and show that that suffices to imply uh, the original statement. Here, I'm going to make a reduction. I'm going to make a reduction to the left primitive ring. I want to show that it suffices to assume R is left primitive. What is a left primitive ring? The ring is called left primitive if there exists a module over the ring which is simple and faithful. Simple means it has no non-trivial module. The only submodules are itself and zero, right? Faithful means if you have an element in the ring, and if you multiply that element to any element of the module and you get zero, that element has to be zero, right? You can think of modules as vector spaces, but not over a field, over a ring. But modules can be very weird. So for example, any vector space is faithful, right? If you have a scalar, you multiply it by any vector and get zero, that has to be zero. But for modules, it may not be the case. So if there exists a simple faithful module over R, R is left primitive, right? One of the very interesting properties of Jacobson radical is that it is equal to the intersection of those ideals like H, such that the quotient of R by H is the left primitive ring, right? This is something that can be proved. So I'm going to take advantage of this. The intersection of all those ideals such that the quotient is left primitive, which is the Jacobson radical, by step one, this intersection is zero. Now, in my ring R, any element raised to some power is equal to itself. If I go to any quotient of R, do you agree that the same hypothesis holds? Right? A to the n of A is A. So if you go mod any ideal, same relation holds, right? So that relation holds in any such quotient for which the quotient is left primitive. If I can show that this quotient is commutative, what does that mean? It means A times B equals B times A mod that ideal. Right? 
which means AD minus BA belongs to that ideal, right? Is that correct? So if I can show that any such quotient is commutative, means that AD minus BA belongs to the intersection of all such ideals, right? And that intersection is zero, right? Because that is equal to the Jacobson radical. Which means AB has to be equal to BA. So it suffices to show that any quotient of that ring, which is left primitive, is commutative. That's all the problem. And it's a very important reduction because once you make this reduction and assume that R is left primitive, you can show that R is a division ring, right? Let's see how we do it. <laughs> now I have to talk about density a little bit. Let's say you have a vector space. Note that vector spaces can be defined not over not only over fields, they can be defined over division rings, right? So let's say delta is a division ring. Can you guys see this? It's very low. Uh, Maybe I rewrite it somewhere. Maybe I rewrite it. Let's say I have a vector space over a division ring. Let's look at the ring of all linear transformations from B to B. I denoted by n of endomorphisms of B over delta. These are the set of all linear transformations from B to B, right? Let's say S is a subset of this. I say that this is dense in here. If you take any finitely many elements that are linearly independent, and also any other vectors inside B, then there exists a linear transformation inside S here that connects this set to this set, f of x i equals y i for every i between one and n. How many of you have taken topology? We can put a topology here over this set that this density means density in the sense of topology, right? Now, if V is finite dimensional, then the only dense subring of this guy has to be itself. It's easy to see. So this is an interesting notion when V is not finite dimensional. Okay. Now, a very beautiful theorem, again, of Jacobson says that, that is called Jacobson density theorem, says that a ring is left primitive if and only if R is a dense subring of endomorphism ring of a vector space over a division. So that characterizes left primitive ring. So by step two, we showed that we can assume R to be left primitive by Jacobson's density theorem. It is a dense subring of endomorphisms of a vector space over fields. So in particular, <laughs> look at the definition of density. I, I can take any two vectors linearly independent. Let's say X and Y are linearly independent in B. Then I can pick also two other elements, no need for linear independence. Let's take those two elements to be y and zero. By density, there exists an f inside r, but r is dense in there, such that f of x equals y and f of y equals zero, right? You agree? That's just the definition. All right, what happens? Apply F to this relation. 
You get x squared of x equals f of y. f of y is zero. So f squared of x is zero. But y equals f of x, right? Right here. And f equals f to the n of f. Note that f is an element of our ring. So by the hypothesis, there exists a power that this is equal to f to that power. And that power has been assumed to be greater than or equal to two, right? And you know the second power over x is zero. So this has to be zero, clear? What happened? X and Y were linearly dependent, right? <coughs> but Y is now zero. What happened? V has to be how many dimensions? Can V have dimension more than two, greater than two? No. So V has to be one dimension, right? Which means, as a vector space over delta, V should be isomorphic to delta, right? Now, here I just mentioned, if V is finite dimensional, the only dense subring is this guy. There are no other dense subring. So R has to be equal to? Go to the keyboard. What should I do? <laughs> Go to the keyboard and hit Control Alt Shift H. Shift type the Control Alt, Shift H. Control Alt Shift H. Control Alt Shift H. Yes. Four keys. Yep. Oh, okay. Good. So R has to be the whole endomorphism ring, and V as a vector space over the division ring is isomorphic to the division ring itself, right? And endomorphisms of delta over delta as a ring is isomorphic to the opposite of delta. Opposite is just the same ring. Order of elements when you multiply is back. A, B, O, P, A. That is the opposite ring. Well, anyway, R is isomorphic to a division ring. So, R is a division ring. Next step. Now I showed that R is a division ring. I'm going to show that any subring of R is also a division. Note that if you have a division ring, then its subrings need not be a division ring, right? For example, Q is a division ring, rational numbers. Its subring Z, integers, is not a division ring. Why is that? Any element has an inverse, so the inverse will not be in this sub. Right. Now, I'm going to show that every subring of this ring is a division ring, which means I need to show that its inverse should be inside that subring. So let's take a non zero element. It has an inverse, right? Let's look at our relation of A equal to since we are inside a division ring, what can we do? We can divide by A, right? So we get A to the N of A minus 1 equals 1. Note that N of A is greater than or equal to 2. We can do it. What does it mean? This means its inverse, A inverse, is A to the N of A minus 2. So the inverse of any element is a power of that element. So if you take any subring, the inverse of any element is inside that subring, right? So the subring has to be a division ring. Also, I can show that characteristic is a prime. Note that a division ring, it has either characteristic zero, right? Or a prime, okay? And what does it mean for a characteristic to be what does characteristic mean? It just means you just add one to itself. Plus one, plus one, plus one. If it never vanishes, the characteristic is zero, right? For example, in integers, you add one. No matter how many times you add one, you don't get zero, right? But in Z mod P, if you add one P times, you get zero, right? So uh, the characteristic is P. 
Here, I just need to show that the characteristic is finite. Oh, sorry, it's not zero, it's positive, right? Then it has to be a prime. As easy to see, let's look at one plus one, raise it to the power n of two. This is two to the n of two. That is equal to two, right? By the assumption. And two is one plus one. Just expand the left hand side, simplify. So you get a bunch of ones added together and get zero, right? So the characteristic is positive. So it has to be a prime P. Now, here we make our assumption. Assume to the contrary that R is not commutative. We're looking for a contradiction. Since R is not commutative, its center is not equal to the whole ring. So there exists an element in the ring that is not in the center. Let's define K to be the subring of R generated by this element A. What does it mean? Any element of K is a polynomial in terms of A with integer coefficients, right? That's the shape of any element B. Then I claim that K is a finite division ring. First off, K is a subring of R, and I just showed that every subring is a division ring. So K is a division ring. And also K is finite. <coughs> why is K finite? Can you tell me why? What is the shape of an element? It's a polynomial in terms of A, the variable let's say is A, and the coefficients come from Z, right? Well, we have an uh, upper bound for the degree. There is a bound for the powers for the degree, because A to the N of A is A, you get back to A. So you have finitely many powers that you can have. What about coefficients? The characteristic. characteristic is P, right? So after P, you get zero, right? So both coefficients and powers are bounded in some sense, so it has to be finite. And as we just mentioned, any finite division ring by a theorem of Weber is a field. So K has to be a field. K is a finite field, right? Characteristic is P. We know from the theory of fields that its cardinality should be a power of P, let's say P to the N, right? In particular, if you raise A to the power P to the N, you get back A, right? Now, this K is a subring of R, so K is already inside R. I can assume that R is a vector space over K. It's a field, right? I can assume that R is a vector space over K, right? It's very obvious. I introduce a new map called D sub A from R to R. What does it do? D sub A. If it acts over any element R, it gives you A R minus R A. This is sometimes called the commutative R and A. Well, it can be easily seen that D sub A is a linear transformation of R as a vector space over K. So it is, it is in the endomorphism ring. Now I'm going to Compose dA p to the n times. Note that p to the n is the cardinality of k. I'm going to compose it with itself, p to the n times. By induction, you can see that this is the sum i from 0 to p to the n, negative 1 to the i, p to the n choose i, a to the p to the n minus i, r a to the n. This can be seen by induction. Now, uh, there is an exercise, maybe in number theory. If you look at this guy, binomial coefficient, and if i is between 0 and p, what property do you know of this guy? Divisible so by p, right? Except for the last two, the middle ones are the proof is fairly easy, right? 
Now I challenge you to prove this. If I put any n over p, still this holds. And now you need to add this twice. Oh yes, the three. I'm going to make use of this. So only the first, because the characteristic is P, right? Only the first and the last one remains. And that is A to the P to the N R minus R A to the P to the N. And A to the P to the N was A, so we get back A R minus R A, which is B A R R. So what I showed is that if you compose this map, this linear equation, <laughs> P to the N times with itself, you get back the map. K is a finite field with P to the N elements. Let's just label its elements as C1 up to C P to the N minus one and C P to the N. And let's assume that the last one is zero, right? From the theory of fields, we know that K is the splitting field of this polynomial and is indeed the set of roots of this polynomial. So we can factor this polynomial x to the p to the n minus x, just like that, with these as the roots, right? Note that the last one is zero. So let's just put it down, right? Now I'm gonna make a polynomial evaluation. Let's let T be a subring of endomorphisms of R over K that is generated by C1 times identity of R up to C to the PN minus one times identity of R D sub A. Note that C1 times identity of R is a map that multiplies everything by C1, right? It's nothing special. T is commutative. Note that endomorphisms of R over K is not commutative, right? And you have two linear transformation, you can represent them with, by matrices, right? They're not commutative, right? But this subring is commutative. The reason is that D sub A is a linear transformation. So it commutes with all those C1 through C to the P and minus. Now the polynomial that I just had, the factorization on the previous slide, I can write it this way. I can assume that the coefficients are those maps. So I replace C1, for example, with the map that multiplies by C. And I consider it as a polynomial factorization over T. Then I evaluate this polynomial at D sub A. On the left, we get D sub A to the P and minus D sub A, which is zero. We just prove that these two are equal. And on the right, we get that. Why is it important that T should be commuted? What happens if T is not commuted? Can I do this or not? Can I evaluate a polynomial if it's over a ring with non commutative coefficients? So let's look at this. X squared plus one equals X plus I times X minus nine. If you assume the coefficients are in Hamiltonian numbers, remember H quaternion. Note that over any polynomial ring with coefficients in a not necessarily commutative ring, the variable x is always in the center, right? So x negative xi equals ix. So you get this factorization. Now let's evaluate it at x equals j. On the left, you get j squared plus one. J squared is negative one, so you get zero. On the right, you get j plus i, j minus i. This is j squared. Plus ij, right? Minus ji, minus i squared. This is negative one, right? 
This is negative one. So these two cancel out. This is K. And this is negative. So this side is 2K. But the left hand side is zero. So these two are not equal, right? So you can evaluate the polynomial at anything you want. The ring over which the polynomial is defined should be created. And the reason is that once you evaluate this guy, what you're doing is that you assume that the evaluation operator is a uh, uh, ring. Uh, Yes, a ring homomorphism. So if you evaluate this, it's like evaluating this times evaluating this. And that only happens over commuting rings. So you can just plug in J to this and hope that this is equal to that. But here, I just showed that T is commuted, and my polynomial factorization is over a commuted ring. So I'm allowed to evaluate, right? Now I'm going to derive a contradiction. I claim that there exists an element R in my ring such that E sub A of R, which is by definition A R minus R A is not zero. The reason is that I took A something, some element outside the center. So there should be an element R that does not commute with A, right? <clears throat> now, I claim that there should be a J between one and P to the N minus one, such that kernel of B sub A minus CJ is not equal to zero. Why is that true? Let's look at this relation up here. Plug in R, DA of R, get DA of R here, right? DA of R is not zero. If this factor is zero, right, then its kernel is not zero. A of R is its kernel, right? If that is zero, go one factor before that here, somewhere here. That factor over this factor is, uh, if that is zero, that is what we're looking for. If that is not zero, go one factor before. But eventually you need to get something zero because the whole factorization equals zero, right? So there should be some J in the middle that has something non-zero in its term, right? Let's call that element B. So there exists a non-zero element B that is in the kernel of this J factor. <clears throat> DA over B gives you AB minus BA, and CJ over B is just multiplication by CJ. So I get that relation. So I write BA, just move it to the right hand side. So I get BA equals AB minus CJB, factor out B, so I get A minus CJB. A is in K. Remember, K was the sovereign generated by A. And CJs are also in K because we just laid out the element of K by C1 through C, P to the N. So this guy is in K, so it is in K times B. So I started from BA and showed that BA is in KB. By induction, I can show that B times A to any power is KB. <clears throat> and this means B times K is in KB because K was nothing but powers of A, right? And by induction, you can show that B to the power I, K is in KB to the power I. Now let's define S to be a ring. K plus KB up to KB to the N of B minus two. This is first of all the subring of R because of this relation. Because if you take any two elements here and you multiply, using this relation, you can write it back in this way. Do you agree? 
you end up with elements inside something like this or some pattern. You can write it in this form, somehow flip it, and then you get back an element in this. So this should be a sovereign. K was finite, and there is a bound on the powers of B. So it is a finite uh, division frame. And note that it is indeed the sovereign generated by A and B, because K was the sovereign generated by A, and also we have powers of B. So S is a finite division rate. Again, we use Wedderberg's theorem and assume and uh, conclude that S is a field. A and B are in S. S is a field, so A and B commute, right? So A B equals B A. Let's look at this relation. C J B equals A B minus B A. So this is zero. C J was also an element of K, right? And K is a field. Multiply by its inverse, so you get B equals zero, right? Are we done or not? B is not zero. Easy <clears throat> contradiction. The contradiction started by assuming that there exists an element in R that is not in the center of R, which means R equals its center, right? So R has to be zero. So this is the proof of Jacobson's commutivity theorem. And this is the beginning of the study of rings over which we have a polynomial identity. They call them PI rings, polynomial identity rings. And there's also a book on this uh, topic. And they study various identities or set of identities that force the ring to be commuted. Any questions? Questions? Yes. Is there a relation between the characteristic of these kind of rings and Mersin primes? Hmm. No, I don't know. Okay. So, can you go back a uh, few slides? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you mean that uh, Jacobson's theorem? No, we, there are three slides for Jacobson's theorem. It, this is the second slide. Which one? The first or second? When, when we say that R uh, is dense in the homomorphism of yes. delta and B, so how, how do we choose delta and B? Well, delta and B will be given by Jacobson's density theorem. That theorem provides a vector space V over a division ring delta so that R is a depth, uh, dense subring of that. And it's if and only if. So a ring is left primitive if and only if it is a dense subring of the endomorphism of the vector space over a division. These will be constructed in the field. Can you go to the next slide, please? There in the second line. Here, that turns out to be the, um, the second smallest number such that um, that is zero. Then I think the the characteristic should be under seen part. Uh, so I, I, I just noticed that. I was wondering if there's a relation. Well, not necessarily, but this shows that characteristic is positive. Mm -hmm. So it's a prior. Yeah. It might be smaller. Right, yeah, but that's, uh, you can, you can. I'm not uh, sure if this is, that is the smallest. I'm just saying like from, from there you can conclude that two to the n minus one, it's gonna be zero. Oh, you're, you're looking you're for. Yeah, so I numbers. just, if that turns out to be a prime, then, then it's gonna receive. So when was this proof? Do um, you know when this proof came out? I think it's old. The Jacobson is dead. <laughs> 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 right. <laughs> but 
Is this the only known proof? Yes, I think so. so. It's not a kind of theorem that you can find everywhere. I just found one book, only one book that could see this proof. Um, you know what I'm saying? Apart from the original Jacobson's paper. But Sorry, is your question doesn't this imply that the characteristic is less than or equal to two to the n two minus two, which is going to be even, and it's so. I mean, it's not even prime. Yeah, if you divide that by two, you get two to the oh yeah okay. minus, well, minus two to some power right. minus so that's the prime. Right, but it could be a different prime divisor of that. Yeah, sure. But yeah, see what you're saying. Other questions? All right. Well, let's thank our speaker. Thank you. Thank you. Next week, I uh, hope you all have a great weekend. I hope to see you all next Friday. That's the one we're also going to say. Terrifying. That's what I did give it. He did like five steps. He did like a realization and then like a problem. He did like a problem. He did like a problem.